Hello, my name is Chris Roberts. Welcome to The Long Road. I'm here with Wayne Woolrich, the Assistant Superintendent of SAU for the Towns. Hello, how are you? Pretty good. How long have you been the Assistant Superintendent for the Towns? Uh, since November 2002. So I've had uh, a number of years of experience with uh, six towns that surround Keene, uh, Chesterfield, West Milan, Marlowe, Nelson, Harrisville, and Marlboro. And I work with uh, Keene as well. And um, I heard that you're getting ready to retire? Well, I have a uh, potential of uh, three years um, in New Hampshire that uh, I'd like to you know, work through that uh, remaining three years. I came from Western Montana, from Missoula, Montana in 1990 as an administrator at Keene High School, assistant principal, eventually uh, served as a principal there and a principal at Jonathan Daniels and now an assistant superintendent for the towns. Um, had a great career in Keene. Uh, I came thinking I'd stay a year or two, and once I arrived, uh, and couldn't imagine a better place to raise children, to have children in schools, to it, really look at the wonderful recreational opportunities and the cultural opportunities in the area. So I came uh, based on a Chamber of Commerce uh, uh, with Ed Burke, uh, Fred Parcells at Central Square, talking about what a beautiful community Keene was, hadn't been to to New England, uh, flew out, uh, did an interview uh, at Keene High School, and I've been here since. I've enjoyed every year, and uh, it's been a wonderful experience. I couldn't, couldn't be happier. You know that I'm bo I was born in Wyoming, and I still go back. I'm planning on going back this summer. It's just something about that area, Montana, Wyoming, Idaho. Big country. Yeah. People are great. But it's quite different from Keene. Yeah. Both of them had their bennies. Yeah, I found a lot of similarities as well as, as differences. It's been wonderful, great contrast. And hopefully you'll take all your three years because we'll miss you if you leave earlier. We'll still miss you if you leave after three years. Thank you very much. So before we talk about New Hampshire education, mm -hmm. we want to talk about a little bit of nationally. Big thing on the news for the past week, week and a half, has been Minnesota. Mm -hmm. The collective, where the governor wants to strip the teachers of the collective bargaining. Can you explain to some of the viewers the difference between their collective bargaining and the collective bargaining in New Hampshire? Yeah. Um, and, and Madison, kind of the epicenter of all this conversation, uh, uh, where most of this sort of has emerged on the national level, and it's uh, Iowa now and Indiana are having some of the conversation. In New Hampshire, uh, in our area, we have 14 collective bargaining agreements. Uh, so when we sit down and look at a contract, we could be working with any one of that 14 different groups. Um, what happens, you know, they will have representatives that will sit down with uh, members of the board and typically uh, somebody from administration and will begin to look at issues that are of interest to both parties. Uh, eventually, of course, they craft an agreement, but that agreement then has to be voted on by the board and has to be voted on by the association. So both groups have to agree that this is something they want to bring forward. Then when they do that, it has to go to the public hearing. So the people have the total opportunity to hear and ask questions relative to the nature of the various agreement. Once it gets through that stage, it has to be voted on either at the district meeting or in, in Keene at the ballot. So it has to be approved by the electorate in order to be moved forward. And typically, these agreements will go two to four years um, and will have kind of graduated uh, steps. Um, and that's been the tradition of our area. But certainly, unlike many states where the vast majority of the funding for local education comes from the state, in Keene, I believe, we're about 17 percent from the state of New Hampshire. So in our case, the, really the local electorate does get involved and has the opportunity, and they've exercised that opportunity in many occasions since I've been in Keene, um, to turn down an agreement and send people back. Um, we currently have two agreements uh, that will be voted on next Tuesday. Uh, both have been favorably approached. I've seen very little really issue relative to the agreements. Uh, you know, there's some concessions in health care, very modest, I think 1.6% percent raise. Um, and then when you start fashioning in the, the health care uh, contributions, there's really very little uh, to argue about in these two agreements. So I don't anticipate the teacher agreement or the agreement with the paraprofessionals to run into much resistance next Tuesday. I think they're pretty responsible. I think both parties uh, understood the economy and the, and the issues that are before them and, and tried to fashion an agreement that represented that reality. And in, in some states, teacher funding 
teacher employment is at the state level. Right. And so <clears throat> I could be a teacher in Keene making $45,000 a year, and I could be a te teacher in a really expensive um, area and making forty five, dollars and it doesn't always work out. Yeah, in New Hampshire, obviously, <laughs> we're... We are local control. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're very, very few states now that have kind of a district meeting where they don't have an autonomous school board, but whereas the electorate can get right in the middle at any point in the process and say, here's how, you know, it's going to be. So I think we've looked in New Hampshire at a statewide salary for teachers. Uh, I really don't think it, it received traction in any way, shape, or form from, from uh, the majority of people in our region. Um, you know, I think it makes sense to look at individual issues, to set individual district goals, and kind of develop a salary schedule and compensation package that meets those issues. And because of the New Hampshire local control, and because the school board doesn't report to the, the mayor, like in some cities in New Hampshire, the mayor says, just cut 15% off the school board, and that's all the school board has to work with. They have to do all the hard stuff. Or like in Providence, Rhode Island, the mayor just said, send layoff notice to 2,000 employees, and we'll decide at the end of the year, after our budget, whether we want to, if we have money for them. But don't you, you risk losing some really quality teachers? Because they can go, area districts want quality teachers. And that's kind of the irony uh, when you really look at it, because it's become more and more <laughs> apparent that the value in, in student learning is in the at the classroom teacher level. A good teacher will make a one and a half year difference. An average student coming into the classroom with a good teacher can expect to gain about a year and a half worth of additional learning. Con conversely, if you enter a teacher who's not very good, you can expect about a half a year of learning. So if you end up two years in a row, if you're unlucky enough to have a poor teacher, and you're grade level behind. As in the same time, if you end up with a great teacher for two years in a row, you're grade level ahead. Now, as far as the teacher that has the easiest time going to another district, it's usually not the poor teacher because their resume, their qualifications, their ability to interview in a way that's compelling is probably not as, a, as good as the great teacher that might have evidence of student learning, of student performance as a classroom. Those are the teachers that can if they feel like they're in jeopardy or if they suddenly feel like their security around future mm -hmm. job is being jeopardized, are much, much ab more able to move. So I think that is a very short-sighted view um, to, to just cut in, in, and then try to backfill depending on what your revenue looks like uh, down the road. There's got to be a, a better way to do it. Because yeah, when I was on a school board before, it seemed that like at least one every year, places like Hanover, who could pay their teachers a heck of a lot more. We'd go around and maybe cherry pick one of our best teachers because they can do more. <clears throat> and so that's the last thing you don't want. You don't want wealthy communities cherry picking the best teachers possible by saying fifteen to twenty thousand dollars more. Right. And yeah, <clears throat> we've been fortunate in our region, of course we have you know, between Keene State, the work that we have with Antioch, close uh, Franklin Pierce being close, uh, we've had a, a good supply of well, of qualified uh, teacher candidates that we've been able to work with through our through our system and through student teaching. We get to know many of these people. So when we finally select somebody, uh, we have both those that want to come into this community, as I did, because it's a beautiful place to, to live and to raise children, but also we have people that are very familiar with the schools, and at the same time, we're familiar with them. So I think we've been able to kind of really mold um, a positive and a very professional uh, cadre of teachers as a result, and we've been fortunate. And we certainly have other issues that we need to deal with, but having a good supply of uh, dynamic, uh, effective teachers hasn't been one of our issues. Well, nationwide, everybody's talking, we got to cut, cut, cut. We had Texas, excuse <coughs> me, who thought they had a surplus, found out they had a deficit, so the governor says, just cut $5 billion from education. Different other states just cut without looking at any of the, the ramifications. <clears throat> what kind of signal do you think it's sending to, to parents, to, to teachers? Why would people want to come into the teaching profession if it can be just sliced off like that? I mean, I, I don't want to complain yes. because we're very fortunate uh, in public yeah. education in our region uh, is, is, I think, much better than in most areas mm -hmm. in the state and in the country. 
But I will say that right now, uh, it feels to many educators that, that they are under attack. Um, and certainly, things have changed. Our global competitiveness uh, has been compromised. We need to do some things. We need to add more time in the school day. We need probably to add more days with students. We need to ramp up expectations around something like the Common Core. I mean, there are, we have some charges, and we need to take them seriously and go for it. But at the same time, understand that our students are in a, a dynamic environment where their ability to compete and as a consequence, our ability to thrive as a nation is much more in jeopardy than ever. We need our best teachers. We need a system where everybody is working together. Now is not the time to throw you know, rocks at each other. But whereas we need to roll up our sleeves and get the best possible outcome we can for our students, they're going to need that. And you can go right down the list, you know, Bill Gates on down. They understand that our ability to maintain our competitive advantage is strictly based on our ability to continue to educate students in a way that will build that capacity. We're bringing in well, 50% of our PhDs in, um, in chemistry last year were foreign, foreign nationals. We are bringing in, and you, you go to like Silicon Valley where they're bringing in people from all over, you know, India and yeah. China. We're not quite meeting that expectation, especially in math and science. So we need to do that, and we can do that here, but we need a cooperative effort. If you look around, you know, at New Hampshire, in one way we're fortunate, given that so little of our funding comes from the state. If the state cuts 10%, that isn't quite the impact that it might have in places where 80 or even 90% of the funding might come from the state. So we're able to manage it locally. The problem is that with our property tax structure, those communities that have a diff more difficult time raising taxes because they, are, they have a lower property evaluation per student are really stuck in a time of economic downturn. Uh, there are other communities, let's say, that have $10 million of property evaluation per student. Keene's probably around 700000 So you can see how much easier it would be if you had that kind of property evaluation to raise enough money to build a new gym, to build a new school. You're not to, picking on our own superintendent, are you? <laughs> I'm not picking on anybody. I understand yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, that there are various groups and winners and losers. But yeah. I contend that it's a little like uh, if you, you have five wards in Keene. If you were to say, base Keene City mm. Government, we're going to charge Ward 1, 2, and 3 this rate, okay. Wards 4 and 5 this rate, you know, people would be a little incensed. Or if you were to say, our military you know, ex uh, budget this year, we're going to charge these states a higher Everybody. percentage of income than... I mean, obviously, when there's a responsibility mm -hmm. of, of the state to educate and provide an adequate education... Um, there is a responsibility to fund that level of adequate education in a fair and equitable way. And, con and currently, uh, in billion in 2009 to $548 billion in 2011, when in fact the budget has increased. For example, 2009, the discretionary budget was $666 billion, with an additional $31 billion in mandatory and additional funding. In 2011, the discretionary budget was reduced from $660 billion to $548 billion, while, while the mandatory and additional budget was increased by, <clears throat> was increased by $160, $190 billion, resulting in about a $20 billion increase. Again, just switch, switching them around, put them in different categories. So you can say one category went from $660 billion down to $548 billion where the average American says, wow, that's good. That was a 20, almost a 20% cut. Again, perfect example of economic ignorance. The government only telling us part of it, while at the same time increasing it in another category for $190 billion. <clears throat> the size of the military has increased very much. A lieutenant colonel is budgeted for regardless if he serves in Iraq or Southern California. A Marine fighter pilot is budgeted for, example, 200 flight hours per year regardless if he flies in South Carolina or in Iraq. Without, a cost, without question, is an additional cost in the war zone. However, we pay and fund military personnel and equipment like fire personnel. There are certain costs whether we use them to fight fires or not. You don't build the majority of the cost to a certain number of fires or, or wars. An aircraft carrier with 200 planes and 5,000 people in the Persian Gulf for six to nine months is already budgeted for 
to assign that sunken cost to the war isn't right and just allows DOD to get additional money through emergency spending bills that require little justification. But it doesn't even cover the hidden costs, such as the increased VA funding to cover injuries, illness, or mental health issues acquired or made worse than active duty. Nor does it under, un, cover unemployment mem payments made to service members unable to get work after leaving active duty. As a disclosure, I have no problem with the defense budget. I have a problem with the, um, maybe the double counting. I spent 21 years in the Marine Corps. At, part of my job was a logistics, so I know how the budgeting process goes. When you go through the regular budget process, the, you have to make choices. You go and you have to um, make certain cuts. You can't get everything you want. But again, with economic ignorance and then playing with um, patriotism and, and a scare factor, you can get an emergency budget supplementation and Congress likes it because then you can add on special projects here, you can add earmarks there, things that have nothing to do with fighting a war or funding the war. <clears throat> Again, when we talk about some other things with economic um, ignorance, the real cost of oil. In 2010, the United States used about 19 million barrels of oil per day, about a 10% drop due to, re due to recession. About 12 billion million barrels of oil was imported on a daily basis. Canada, Mexico, and Saudi Arabia had the list of the top 15 countries in supplying the United States with imported oil. Combined, the top 15 countries provide about 8.5 million barrels every day, or about 70% of all imported in oil and petroleum products. Canada and Mexico combined over 3.5 million barrels per day, or about 30% of imported oil requirements. <clears throat> Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and Kuwait provide only about 1.6 million barrels a day, less than 15% of the dairy requirement, or about 7% of all the oil used in the United States every, every day. There's a big difference between OPEC and the Persian Gulf. Persian Gulf oil producers are members of OPEC, but not all OPEC members are from the Persian Gulf. From the time period of 2003 to 2010, the United States used an average of about 19 million barrels a day. Prior to the Iraq war, the average price of oil was about $20 a barrel. Since the start of the war, the price of oil has peaked about $140 per barrel, with the average price of $70 to $85 a barrel. Prior to the start of the war, we were spending about $380 million per day for oil, or about $190 million per day for foreign oil. We, pay about, we paid about $140 billion per year for oil, sending about, <clears throat> about $70 billion overseas each year. With oil at $60, it went from $380 million to $1.14 billion per day, increasing our yearly bill to about $416 billion, sending almost $220 billion overseas. <clears throat> With oil at $80, we went from $380 million per day to $1.5 billion per day, increasing our yearly costs to $554 billion, sending about $300 billion overseas each year. It was like every man, woman, and child in the United States spending, sending $1,000 per year overseas. <clears throat> when oil hit 140, we were spending over $2.6 billion a day for oil. Even if the price of oil had increased by 100% from its 202 price level, the American people have paid about $2.5 trillion in increased oil price, prices partly related to the Iraqi war. Again, economic ignorance, we talk about the cost of the war, but we're not talking about the increased price of oil, $2.5 trillion in oil, when, and then oil produces a lot of plastic, produces a lot of food, transportation, so increase, we could easily argue that as a result, there's been about $4 trillion of soft costs that are not, as, as a result of the war, but not have contributed to the cost of the war. <clears throat> Another one that just came up, the unemployment tax cut and the price of oil. Part of the extending the Bush tax cut is like, what does 2% reduction on um, Social Security have to do with the price of oil? Very little was talked about 
the hundred and twenty billion dollars that the federal government would have to borrow to cover the cost and lost Social Security revenue. So it's here's a kind of a trick. The federal government <clears throat> will borrow hundred and twenty billion plus dollars from maybe China, Japan, or the Federal Reserve will find a way to come up with the money. Then the federal government will then take that money it borrowed to pay back to Social Security. We all know there is no lockbox, <clears throat> and Social Security payments come out of general revenue. Excuse me. <clears throat> and <clears throat> it even looked. Oops, oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> it even looks that maybe next year we have, we have to pay about $60 billion out of the general fund just to cover the cost of Social Security. We've been told that the 2% um, payroll tax deduction will do wonders for the United States, help increase the economy, put more people to work. The average American earns about $20 per year or about $40,000. So that would result in a savings of about $800. So. Let's talk about the people in Keene. One of the things that happened is due to the increased United States debt, the value of the dollar goes down. Since most oil is priced in dollars, the cost of oil goes up. The price of gas is about 40 cents a gallon higher than it was last year. For the average American driving around 1,200 miles, 12,000 miles a year, that means the cost of gas has increased by at least $200. The same increase in pr in price of heating oil that is resulted in about a $400 increase in the heating cost for a small home kept at 60 degrees. So most people, the increased price of oil has wiped out any benefit that could have been expected from the payroll tax deduction. Instead, the government has to borrow more and more money resulting in higher oil prices. <clears throat> the extension of the Bush tax cuts will reduce govern government revenue over the next 10 years by about $4 trillion or about $15,000 per every woman and child. Again, so you talk about $800, so you'll get an $800 benefit for this year, while at the same time, your, the tax burden, the debt burden will increase by $15,000. So even if the taxes don't go up, you're still going to have to pay interest on that. And so easily, again, if you had a $15,000 debt on your credit card, you know you're going to pay more than $800 in interest over the next 10 years. So... One of those, again, if you made $40,000, you gave $800 back, you paid it in higher oil and food prices, and in return for that, you get a $15,000 bill. <clears throat> and, so, one of the, <clears throat> and so because prices have gone up so drastically, we have to play political games that we have to make some cuts. We're going to talk, in Congress right now, is talking about a $60 billion cut. At a 1.5 to 1.8 trillion dollars, 60 billion, while it's a start, doesn't really contribute to it. They don't have the political courage to come and say, you know what, we have to make bigger cuts. This is why we have to make bigger cuts, and this is way, where we're going to make the bigger cuts. Americans are not going to like the bigger cuts, and there's going to be some pain with the bigger cuts. But you know what, Americans like to be told, and Americans can adjust. <clears throat> For example, one of the proposals that's right on, on the table right now under H.R. 1, which probably will be passed, the president will veto it, but they'll argue back and forth. New Hampshire, for example, Title I money for children that come from poor families. This gives the children the opportunity to catch up on reading because in a lot of times, children coming from poor families are a little behind, some more than others. And so if we can give them the chance in those first couple of years to catch up on reading, they become very, they're much more successful in school. They have a greater chance of being a productive member of society. So instead of being on the welfare rolls or some of the other ones, they're out there. They have a good job. They're earning money. They're paying taxes. The state of New Hampshire stands to lose $6.4 million. The, the 21st um, Century Learning Centers, money that goes to, and some of the other ones, that go to like the Cheshire um, Career Center, where again, people go in there, kids that go in there, 
they're not going to go to college, but they can still go and get a productive job. You got nurse, <clears throat> nursing students, they may get an LNA, get really excited, later on go to college and get an RN. RN, they may make fifty to sixty thousand dollars a year. People can go into um, auto mechanics. Here in Keene, Markham, Tinkham, other companies are looking for quality individuals. We're going to cut those. That's one of the proposals. Cut that. So where do the children um, get that quality education? <clears throat> the other one right now, we're looking at Pell Grants. The state of New Hampshire stands to lose $12 million, which means that 21,000 children from <clears throat> low income to, mid er, low to middle income working class families, their opportunity to go to college is going to be greatly reduced. 21,000 members. <clears throat> the other ones, grants to states for workforce investment. You know, New Hampshire again stands to lose about three and a half um, million dollars, which the adult service um, participants, 4,400 um, adults who are trying to get off welfare rolls, who are trying to accomplish, overcome some disabilities and other problems in their life, who want to become productive citizens. Those 4,400 will not be able to, to get that training, get that service. So that 4,400 that we don't want to pay for, are still, we're still going to pay in another area. We're going to pay whether they're on welfare or social service areas. The idea is to spend money to make them productive. <clears throat> dislocated workers, company closes down, 400 dislocated workers will not going to be, have the opportunity to, to retrain and to um, get another job. Youth services, 700 youths, youths, Y-O-U-T-H, not, not the sheep, will not get services. Again, quality services keeps them out of the criminal justice system. So here it is, we want to save some money in one area, but then they go into the criminal justice system, they cause um, court costs go up, and a few of them may end, end up in the county farm at about $130 a day. Preventive. <clears throat> a big one right here, mental health and substance abuse block grants. Right now, the New Hampshire stands to lose about a million dollars. As anybody knows, that quite a few of the individuals that are in our county farm are there because they have mental health issues. For many of them, the first time they've ever been treated for mental health issues is after they've been arrested. So if we can't be proactive and help them now, we're going to help them at the county farm at a much higher level. <clears throat> and if they're at the county farm, while that's bad, it is much worse than having to spend two, three, four years <clears throat> up at the state, in the state prison. The low-income housing. There was just a recent article in the Keene Sentinel talking about the lack of low-income housing. And people are working. Right now, the public housing capital fund in the state of New Hampshire stands to lose almost $3 million. Again, where do we allow people to get the housing? Housing is important to people's dignity. If they can't get a place to live, how can they work? How can they set the example for their children? We all know the number of, um, we all, a number of us know the number of homeless shelters that are in Keene. The idea is we, the, most of these people don't want to be in a homeless shelter. They want to be productive members. They want the opportunity. They don't want a handout. They just want to be able to do something. Another one, community block, CB, CDBGA grants. Things that um, the city uses, things that the county uses. Right now, the state of New Hampshire stands to lose $9 million. It's hard to believe. $9 million. Some of these grants are up to $500,000. They use them to fix up old houses to give people a place to live. Again, we can sit here all day and say we don't have the money. We don't have the money. And the question is, yes, we don't have the money, but should the money go to the people who have the most lobbyists? Does it go to the people that are most vocal? Does it go to the people with the most, the bigger agencies? 
without question, if you're a lobbyist for an agency, no matter what it is, whether it's the Red Cross or it's the corn growers or whatever, your priority is to maximize the government support for the people who are paying you. If it means taking it away from someone else, you take it away from someone else. So right now what we're looking at in this brutal thing, brutal cuts going forward, who's going to speak for the people? Who are going to speak for the people in Keene, for example, who are making 10, 12 bucks an hour, struggling to pay their rent, struggling to pay? They don't have any voice. They just don't have a voice. We need someone to speak for them. And it's really important. We need to be able to give people the opportunity to take care of themselves, to work hard, and to um, develop a, a future. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to take a quick break for um, a few public service uh, announcements, and we'll be right back to talk about some of the social issues that politicians like to play with us. Today is a special day. Today we gather as a nation and as an international community to recognize the selfless decision of one of the most influential women of our time. She's been recognized by religious figures and politicians around the world. To us, she's just Rachel. But to the rest of the world, she is the woman who, after having one too many drinks, chose not to drive home buzzed. Here today to honor Rachel is the family whose lives she spared. moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. So, uh, Malcolm, you do know that energy savers last six times longer than ordinary light bulbs. This isn't my room. It, it's, it's Baron Davis's. Baron Davis, the basketball player? This is his room? Yep. Interesting, because we have Baron Davis right here. Baron, do you live here? No. I don't mean that, Baron Davis. Millions of kids are using their energy wisely. What's your excuse? Well, we're back. Hope you enjoyed the PSAs. Again, which is important, let's, for children, especially for the men, whether your father there or your distant father, take time to be a dad to your children. It'll pay dividends, and the children will really appreciate it. They may be mad at your time because you're not there, but they will appreciate you, you taking that time. So as I stated, we were going to talk about some of the, the um, social issues. For some of the people who remembered a few years ago, a few years back, I wrote an article that appeared in the Keene Sentinel, Sentinel that said that we failed the people of New Hampshire, both Democratic and Republican Party, we failed because we spent so, many so much time on social issues. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Yes, we did spend a lot of time on social issues, and those social issues were important, but the number one priority at that time was the fiscal problems. We didn't do it, and the fiscal problems got worse and worse each year. So before I go and talk about the, um, some of the social issues, I'm going to give a little quote that by Jacob Wilson, an individual from about the 1885. He goes, we have party rule not for the country's good, but the, for the good of the party. <clears throat> and to speak against the party is heresy. He says, Pol politics as a rule is built largely upon, upon unfounded assertions and assumptions. Each party puts, faith, puts forth its claim without the slightest regard to evidence or the facts. If there's any good that happens, the party claims it, saying, 
see we were right, we were the smart ones. If anything wrong happens, they're always willing to place the blame on the other party. So now we're up in New Hampshire and we're talking about social issues. You know, you had the Tea Party, you had the Democratic Party, you got the Republican Party, and you got groups all in between. But it's really amazing. You have people up there, and I feel really uncomfortable up in Concord because it just doesn't feel like that many of the people up there are worrying about the average person from New Hampshire. <clears throat> they go and they say, we want smaller government, excuse me, smaller government, we got to cut government, we need government out of our lives. They'll say, it's my right not to wear a seatbelt, not to wear a helmet, to do whatever I want. But you know what? They're flying down the road. They get into a car accident. They go through the front windshield. They get a severe head injury. They didn't have insurance. And then what do they do? They want the state of New Hampshire to say, hey, pay for it all. It's my right. You're, you're supposed to pay for me. You're supposed to take responsibility for me. Where the average head injury costs the state of New it costs about $4 million. So it's my right not to have insurance, but if something goes wrong, it's the state's responsibility. A little hypocrisy. So you go back and forth. They go, I don't want to pay Medicare taxes. I don't want government health care. I don't want, I don't want. So everything's going along great. I don't have to do anything. Then mom or dad comes down with Alzheimer's disease or some of the other ones. And what's the first thing some of them do? is how do they find a lawyer and say, how do I go in and find a way to hide mom and dad's assets or transfer mom and dad's assets into a trust or to myself so I can put mom and dad in the county nursing home at the county expense, at the local taxpayer's expense. Again, a, a little hypocrisy. What are we going to do? Again, we have some individuals who say, you know what? I don't want to pay Social Security. It's a total waste. I can make more money over the course of my lifetime by wise investing. Well, very few of us are that wise investors. There's not many Warren Buffetts out there. But they say, nope, nope, nope. But then I have a child born with severe handicaps. And the first thing they go and say is, you know what? I need to get DSI for my child. But that child has never paid a single penny into the Social Security Fund. <clears throat> Congress, presidents have taken the easy way out. Instead of creating a fund for that, they says, you know what, let's increase it. Let's just take it out of Social Security. It will cause, hey, we don't have to raise taxes, which keeps people happy. We're providing a service, which keeps the people happy. We get greater votes. So, again, some of the hypocrisy, and the hypocrisy is not limited to Democrats or Republicans. It's a lot of them. A lot of people worry about their own self-interest. And one of the best ways to worry about and take care of your own self-interest is run for politics. Again, you know what? I'm a politician, so I have to go and say, you know what? People, most people in politics for their own self-interest. We just don't have a lot of politicians that we had in the past. Yeah, we can argue back and forth, you know, going all the way back to the beginning of the country. They were still politicians back there that were looking out for their best interest. When you go in right now, some of the social issues that we're spending time on, okay, they call it gay marriage. Some people call it marriage equality. Okay, marriage, marriage, it all depends. What, do you, what is it? But it's something strange. What we want to do is, we, I think it's about 1,000 couples in New Hampshire that have married whether they're gay, men, or lesbians, who matters? They, they love each other, plain and simple. They're not bothering anybody. They're not rubbing in the people's face. They're just two loving people that just want to live their lives together. And the other side is we go and say, let's pass some laws because gays and lesbians can't raise children. Here it is. We don't want gays and lesbians to raise children but we have no problem warehousing children in foster care system, which has some of the worst abuse. Not all, but some of the worst abuse that happens to some of our children are nameless children 
who go from foster care, foster home to foster home to foster home. We don't want gays and lesbians, but we don't want to pay any money, make sure the children are taken care correctly and safely. One of the things that always got me up there was <clears throat> if my best friend was a female and she came to me and says, Chris, I'm dying and I don't have any health insurance, I could go out and marry her, save her life by giving health insurance. <clears throat> if my best friend was a male and I says, you know what, I I'm gonna mar I'll marry you so you get health insurance. In certain states and what they want to do in New Hampshire, they say no. That's a, it's against God's will. It's a bingo. I would then have to sit there and watch my best friend die. Okay. Marriage, gay marriage, marriage equality. I like to believe any two consenting adults should be able to work into an arrangement that serves their best interest without damaging society. <clears throat> and so, to me, that's a social issue that goes back and forth, which distracts from handling the fiscal matters. <clears throat> Again, we want to talk about abortion, whether a woman's right to choose. The Supreme Court has already determined that a woman's right to choose. They may be able to go first, second semester, no problem, depending on where the country is, where, where they're living in the country. But that's a moral issue. That's for each individual to worry about. It's been proven over and over again, we can't legislate morality. Again, we have people who say, you know what, every pregnancy must end in a birth. That's God, but that's what God wants. I'm not that smart. I'm not going to go and even judge that I know how God is, is thinking. But again, if we want to ensure that every birth results in a healthy child, then we need to ensure this and spend for proper prenatal care to increase the chances of that child being healthy. Then we have to pay for a quality education for that child to be able to grow up and be a public a productive member of society. <clears throat> if that child is, is unwanted, we need to ensure that we have adoption laws and other safeguards so those child, children can go into loving homes. It doesn't matter where it's gay, lesbian, black, white, yellow. A home is a home and a child just wants to be loved and that's all a child deserves. Does it cost? Yes, it costs. We, as leaders, we just can't go and say, you know what, it's a child, it must be born, and just leave it wherever it falls. These are children, they're not dogs that we throw into um, the humane society or other places. If a child is going to be born, we as a, as a society have responsibility to that child. <clears throat> Another big issue, we're cutting, we're saying, hey, Mental health, we don't want to pay, we don't have to pay for mental health. Well, depending on where you look, maybe one out of four, one out of every five people will have serious mental health issues during the course of their lifetime. Some of those issues will be lifelong. Some of those issues will be short. For example, a service member coming back from Iraq or Afghanistan may have PTSD with the proper mental health treatment he or she will learn how to deal with that, that PS, PSTD and then become a functional member of society. But if we don't want to spend money, the guy wakes up in um, the middle of the night with a nightmare, gets angry, pushes his wife, punches his wife. First thing we do is we arrest him and we throw him into jail for domestic violence. No domestic violence <clears throat> is justifiable. But if the individual is domestic violent because he has PTSD from the war zone and we don't want to spend a little bit of money to help that 22, 23-year-old kid or man because he's been in the war zone, whose fault is it? But no, again, we could put him six months in the county jail at $100 plus dollars, um, <clears throat> a day or eighteen dollars to $20,000 but we're not going to spend a few thousand dollars to give him proper mental health treatment. Then we go and say, we want to take children that we used to warehouse 
<clears throat> in homes because they had handicaps, Down, children with Down syndrome and other ones. But we as a society says that's not the way to treat our children. That's not the way to treat people. They're not dogs. They're not going to be warehoused. They're going to be treated. I know I have to be careful because people love their dogs, and I'm, I'm not saying it in a, in a negative way. They need to be treated as human, okay? But they want to go out on their own. They want to be self-sufficient. But we're saying is, you know what? We don't want to invest the money <clears throat> in giving them the opportunity to be productive. They may get, be productive. They may be able to go in a group home. They may be able to go and get some jobs. It's amazing. <clears throat> it doesn't have to be a big paying job, but the fact that you can live in your own home, get up, go to work, even if it's minimum wage, have a sense of accomplishment and go home makes a world of wonders for a lot of people. But we go, no, we're not going to do it. It's just not society's re responsibility. <clears throat> and you sit there and, and you look over and over. Now, look at the worst case. The worst case that's going to have the greatest negative effect on the people of New Hampshire is what we want to do with school funding. What we're saying is we had the right to decide what an adequate education is. We said an adequate education only costs 3,400 3, bucks. $3,400. Where can you get an adequate education for $3,400? I can get, give you an adequate education for $3,400 if I want to be able to teach you just to read and write and do simple math so I can get you a job as a teller at one of the big box stores. So you can spend the rest of your life working 8 to $9 an hour. I don't think that that's the people in New Hampshire want for their children. If you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, we're talking about how New Hampshire is such a, a fast-growing, one of the fastest-growing job-producing states in the country. Well, yep, but most of those jobs are going to be in real tail, 8 to $10 an hour. They're going to be in the hospitality services so they can work at the motels so we can bring the guests, the tourists come in to spend their money. Again, 10 to 12 bucks an hour. 12 bucks an hour, about $22,000, $24,000 a year. Another fast growing one is line cooks, 12 to $15 an hour. Is that the quality of education we want? If we want to spend 3,400, that's the quality of education. If we want to spend 3,400, again, one of the fastest growing one is nursing assistance to take care of the elderly. But nursing assistance, again, 10 to 12 bucks an hour. I don't think that's what we want. Now we're talking about reducing the cost, the definition of adequate education to the three R's. If any community says, you know what, I want hard science, I want physics, I want art, the community has to come up with it. Where is the community going to come up with that money? We have a lot of communities around New Hampshire who are very poor. But you know what, we said no big deal, we'll reduce the value of um, an cost of an adequate education to 2,800 bucks. In a way, we're really insulting the intelligence of the, of the people uh, of New Hampshire. Then we're going to say, you know what, we're not going to cut educa adequate education. What we're going to do is say, hey, we spent X number of this dollars this year, we're going to spend the next, next same next year and the year after. We don't care how many more kids come into the system. We don't care how many more children have extra needs. We're just not going to do it. We're saying that's not our responsibility. Right now, one of the goal is to make sure that we do not have a single donor town. We have now determined, we want to determine in the state of New Hampshire is your accident of birth will determine the quality of your education. If I don't want, if I live in a community on the lake and I have a $2 million home, I may pay less taxes than a $250,000 home in the city of Keene. Yes, the city of Keene values the quality of their education. They know, just like the founding fathers stated, the education is the greatest equalizer that we have as Americans and in democracies. So basically what we say is if I live in a community where there are no children or I live in a community where there's no school and my children go to private schools, 
I will not have to contribute one single cent to the education of New Hampshire students. But wait a minute. What we're saying is, if I live in a community, it's the state's responsibility to ensure that I have well-maintained roads. It's the state's responsibility that I have good air and good water to drink. It's a safe responsibility to provide policemen, state troopers, to ensure that I have a high level of security. But we're going to look at the children of New Hampshire and say, you know what? It's not the state's responsibility. It's not my responsibility to contribute to your education. How? I, I just don't understand how we could sell that. We could go and tell a six or seven year old kid, sorry, your education doesn't matter to me. I'm not going to pay for your education. I have no problem paying for a $400 round of golf. I have no problem buying a $60,000 car, but your education doesn't matter. <clears throat> it, to me, it doesn't make it doesn't make sense. So instead of dealing with the fiscal issues, what we're going to do is we're just going to spend more and more and more time dealing with social issues. And when, in fact, <clears throat> we can't take care of the quality of our, our citizens. We can't take care of the children. We can't take care of the working people. We can't take care of the elderly unless we handle our fiscal problems, unless we solve our fiscal problems. Again, the people of New Hampshire, they don't want a handout. They don't want to be taken care of. They just want to have an opportunity to do their best. They want an opportunity to get themselves better and do more for their children. And again, smaller government, yes, government has to get smaller. Yes, government has to spend less money. Yes, <clears throat> government has to allow people to be responsible for their own actions. Yes, government has to hold people accountable for what they do or what they fail to do. But if government doesn't do that, we're going to have problems as a people because people, mothers and fathers, want to take care of their children. Mothers and fathers want to be able to have a job. Mothers and fathers want to be able to go to bed at night <clears throat> with a sense of security. As a kid, growing up on welfare, I went to bed every night cold but not freezing. I went to bed every night hungry but not starving. Twice a year, my mother got vouchers. You got two pairs of pants, navy blue or black. You got two shirts, you got a pair of shoes. Winter time came, you had it again. If you needed glasses, you got those ugly glasses. But what it said was, I go, and other people like me says, this really sucks. I don't want to spend the rest of my life with this. I don't want to spend the rest of my life living in a project. I don't want to spend the rest of my life in a little room with six of my brothers, five of my brothers on three bunk beds. So it put a hunger in the individual. And as the hunger, we worked hard to become better, to become more productive. Government has to realize you do people, you do not do people any good by quenching that hunger. If government is gonna do anything, it has to light the fire individuals so they can go forth and they become better people. So I know I've rambled along for a long period of time. I know there are some people that are going to go out there and say, well, you know, your facts may not have been exact. No, the facts are not exact. They're approximations, but that's the purpose. The idea is to get you to think, to get you to question. If you think my facts are wrong and you went out and decided and double-checked whether you Googled it or you went to the library, then I serve my purpose because you went out to find the facts for yourself. You've made a determine what is factual based on your experiences. So that's what we need to do. So again, thank you for your time. I, hopefully I didn't waste your time. And so see you in the future. Maybe I'll see you out there on the long road.